As the song we just sung indicated, I think this is true for every one of us, and I think we can say it this way, I want to go to heaven, don't you? I want to be in a place where there are no sorrows of this world. I want to be in a place where death never happens again, don't you? You, just as I can, can think of all of those that we've known who are no longer here. I can think of a list of folks in Sparta, Tennessee who are no longer here. I can think of a list of folks from here who are no longer here. Just as much as I can, I know that you can. Think about heaven for just a minute. There'll be no more parting like that in heaven. I want to go to heaven, don't you? As we study this morning, I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 to begin our study. You know, we are a people who are blessed. To be able to recognize that inside of God's Word, we can be built up. And I love Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 for several reasons. I see three distinct reasons, one in every verse of this particular verse, or particular section of verses. Number one, we recognize that faith is not just in the things that we see, it's in the things that we do not see. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not physical. You know, you can have faith this morning that this podium is here. Can't you? You see, that's, to a degree, a false sense of faith, isn't it? Because you can see it. But there's a lot that has to do with faith that's beyond what we can see. And, and faith is the substance of things hoped for. I don't know what heaven's going to look like in all of its grand details. We're given a lot of information in Scripture, but I don't have the exact, and neither do you. But I want to be there. Because it's told to me in God's Word. It's not like something on this earth that I can see. I can hope to have something on this earth. Number two, in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, I recognize that faith has a lot to do with eldership. If you read verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good report. Faith has to do with the way that we live. And our faith inside of God has to do with the way people perceive us. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Number three, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 tells me this, and this is in the end of this particular section. It says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. Do you recognize that? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. And I love the end of the verse. It tells us that the earth may look like it was made with certain things, but it was not made with things that it's seen. We recognize that inside of faith, I understand that in the fundamentals of it, it's not just about the things that I see in this world. But it's about things that are past or beyond this world as we live. Now, interestingly enough, the word faith is, to me, a very interesting word because of the way it's used in Scripture. It's used 247 times in Scripture. Now, this is what I find very interesting about it. It's only used twice in the Old Testament. And it's used 245 different times inside of the New Testament. Now this morning, we will not be looking at the 247 different times the word faith is used inside of Scripture. But I do want you to see what's happening inside of the way this particular word is used inside of the Old Testament and inside of the New Testament. Two passages in the Old Testament that tell us about the word faith. One is Deuteronomy 32 20 and the other is Habakkuk 2 4. Now, Deuteronomy 32 19 and 20 is what I want you to see, but this particular section is a section of scripture. It's talking about God's people and it's talking about the idols of the world that God's people are putting before Him. 
And listen to what the passage says. It says, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see their end or what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, a perverse generation. Then it reads this. Children in whom is no faith. What happened to God's people? They lost their faith in God, their belief system in God, their knowledge inside of God. And they allowed the idols of the world, the man-made things of religion, to be what drove them in the world. See, the very first time the word faith is used, it's used in a negative sense about God's people. Number two, the word faith is used in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And this is a very interesting particular section. It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. I love this in the Old Testament. The two ways the word faith is used in the Old Testament. Number one, it's used in a negative way in Deuteronomy 32, 20. But number two, it's used in a positive way. There is the person who is walking in himself in Habakkuk 2.4, and there is the person who is walking in faith, and he is described as just. He is a just person. Matter of fact, Habakkuk 2 through 5 is a section that talks about how the just shall live by faith. In other words, if we take God's word, we live it in our lives, we will be people who walk after a faith inside of God. Now, the word faith is used 245 times in the New Testament. And just like with the Old Testament, we're only going to look at two, one of which I believe is very familiar with you, and the other is the last occasion where it's used in the book of Romans. Matter of fact, the word faith is used most in the book of Romans and in the book of Hebrews. Inside of those two books carries almost 125 uses of the word faith. So if you want to learn about faith, you read the book of Romans and you study it. You want to learn about faith, you read the book of Hebrews and you recognize what faith is. But one is very familiar to us. It's Romans 10, 17. It's a favorite passage of ours, especially of mine. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We start to kind of define this positive and negative word faith, don't we? We get the illustration of it in the Old Testament and the way it's used, but we get the application of it inside of the New Testament. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Where's my faith built? You see, faith has to be something that is built inside of the Word of God. And matter of fact, Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 5, and going all the way down to verse 21, is a section of Scripture that tells you and me that salvation can be had or obtained by all of mankind. There's not a person on the face of this earth who cannot go to heaven. And let's bring something up of where we started this morning. I want to go to heaven, don't you? And I understand, and I think you understand, that my faith is going to be connected to where I'm going to go in eternity. And I want to go to heaven. And therefore, I know I have to have a faith that comes after the words of God. You see, the words of man just simply will not do. Also, this word is used in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. And it's an interesting section. It talks about power. It starts out by saying, Now to him that is of power to establish or establish you, according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known unto all nations for the obedience of the faith. You're going to find when you study the word faith a connection to the word obedience. In fact, one of my favorite verses connected to faith and obedience, Hebrews 5, 8, 9, the ending of that particular passage, unto all them that obey him. If I want to have salvation, I must obey Jesus. And I love Romans 16, 25, and 26 for this reason. If you notice in verse 25, the preaching that was presented had to do with Jesus Christ. And therefore, there's something we must mention this morning. If it were not for Jesus Christ, we could not have faith. You see, the eternal plan of God was for Jesus Christ to come into the world, to be the Messiah that everyone was looking for, and to be the Lamb that was slain without spot and without blemish. And let me tell you, without Jesus Christ, 
the planning of God would be null and void. He says, in my preaching, Jesus Christ is there. He says, in the preaching of the prophets, Jesus Christ was there. And therefore, we must be a people who are obedient unto Jesus Christ. 247 times the word faith is used inside of Scripture. But what we're trying to do today is we're trying to figure out how we can make our faith be an active faith. How we can have our faith that is filled with actions that we can use. And here's what I want to tell you this morning before we really begin our two points of our study. Number one, this morning, I will not call you, I will not ask you to leave this building and go talk to anyone outside of this building. What I want us to do in this word study of faith this morning is to recognize how our faith must be increased right here. Yes, I want you to go invite people to know the Lord. Yes, I want you to invite people to come and study about the Lord. But I want you to do something for yourself this morning. And that's how we're going to illustrate faith. But number two, I'm not going to ask you to do anything outside of this building, but I am going to ask you to do some things inside of the church. The church is the people, isn't it? We make up the church. Jesus Christ died for the church. He didn't die for this building. He died for you and me. There are things that we can do not only internally in our lives, but also externally inside of the church, outside of our lives. We're going to look at a point entitled faith and self. And that on the surface of it sounds strange, doesn't it? Because you and I know that I can't have faith in self and go to heaven. But I want to illustrate to you that I've got to know that I can go to heaven. And I've entitled it faith in self. Number two, I want us to look at a section entitled faith in others. And what we're going to do is we're going to go inside of Scripture and pick out one group of people. And we're going to draw the comparison off that group of people, how we can have faith in others. And in both of these two points, we're going to make the applications of how we can be people who have a faith that's built on action or a faith that's filled with action. Number one, I want you to think about Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It's a, it's a powerful verse that teaches us about ourselves and also teaches us about Christ. It reads this way, and you can see it on the screen. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You see, without Jesus Christ, every person in this room would be hopeless, wouldn't we? Without Jesus Christ, every person in this room, and, and dare I say it this way, without Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be here, would we? You see, without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we would have nothing to hope for. Without Jesus Christ, we would have no reason to have faith. Without Jesus Christ, we would have no reason to live after God. But because of Jesus Christ... We have everything in which to live for. And therefore, I understand in Philippians 4 verse 13 that I must be a person who if I want to endure in this life, I must recognize my strength comes from Jesus Christ. But I want you to center in on three words. I can do. I believe Philippians 4.13 tells you you've got to have a faith in Christ, but also Philippians 4, 4 verse 13 tells me that I must recognize that I can do this. I can live the Christian life. I can recognize what Scripture teaches me. I can go to heaven. Let's, let's make a phrase we've already made today. I want to go to heaven. How about you? And Philippians 4 verse 13 tells me that. But it tells me that I must have a degree of pride in my life so that I do what I'm supposed to do so that I live as I'm supposed to live. Here are three things you can do to so strengthen your faith and to know that you can go to heaven. Number one, you can be a person if you want to grow in self. You can be a person who grows in or by prayer. It's Luke 22 verse 40 and it's a beautiful section. It's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he had brought his disciples with them and he had, was preparing to leave them to go a little further to pray. And he tells them, he tells them in Luke 22 verse 40, he says, pray ye that ye enter not into temptation. I love the scenes of this because the disciples, they didn't quite know what was getting ready to come. Jesus knew what was coming. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. His death was near. His disciples knew he was going to die, but they didn't know when. And they never could conceive in their minds it was really going to happen. They never wanted to be outside of the physical presence of Jesus. 
And he brings them into the garden to pray with them, the disciples of whom he loved. And he tells them, you've got to pray that you enter not into temptation. They may not have understood what that meant at the time, but I think later on they could look back on the words of Jesus and recognize they knew what that meant now. How's your prayer life this morning? How's your prayer life? Have you prayed this morning? Now, here's what I'm asking you. Have you prayed outside of the worship and Bible class assembly this morning? The answer, yes or no, to that question will help you see the picture of your faith, will help you see whether you believe you can go to heaven or not, will help you see whether you recognize that you have strength in Christ or not. And it can also tell you that you can grow. You can grow by prayer. There's another way you can grow, and it is by study. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that's one of my favorite passages about study. It's a passage that says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't God's word powerful? But I love the ending of this particular verse. It says that it's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you want to know how your life is? Do you want to know how your faith resides? Do you want to know what your faith looks like? Open up God's Word, and you will recognize what your faith looks like. That's why passages like Romans 10, verse 17 are so crucial to our faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you ever wondered if something was wrong, or if something was sinful? How do you know that? It's in a study of God's Word. If you want to be better, if you want to be a better person, if you want to be better inside of your faith, you study God's Word. You see, there are a lot of things that can be studied in this world. But God's Word will trump them all. At the end of the day, let me say it this way. At the end of life, the only thing we will regret is if we were a Christian or if we were not. And those are big words to feel. And based upon how we live with God's Word is how we're going to live when we're outside in the world. If you want to grow inside of your faith, you've got to study God's Word. But number three, if you want to grow inside of your faith, you have to make application of your study. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see this. Now I know that Matthew chapter 5, especially when you get into verses 29 through 30, Matthew chapter 5 is a section of Scripture that's talking about lust. And if you look at verses 27 through 28, you'll recognize what this is. Jesus saying, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But, Jesus, or, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's talking about lust. But look at what he says about it. And this is verses 29 and 30. He says, And if thy right hand offend thee, pluck it out. And cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not the whole body should be cast into hell. Here's where I want you to grow in application. As you spend time in prayer with God, as you spend time in study with God, make the application from God. And here's the reality of this. It's hard. I know it's hard. You know it's hard. When I recognize I'm in sin, I've got to cast it from me. That's the hard application of Scripture right here in Matthew 5, 29 and 30. The hardest thing in life is not becoming a Christian. Matter of fact, I would suggest to you that that's the easy part. The hard part of being Christian, the hard part of having faith, the hard part of having a faith in self that is active is cutting out the areas that are sinful. And ladies and gentlemen, that does not happen overnight. May I suggest to you and to me that that takes a lifetime to do? The illustration here in Matthew, 20, or Matthew 5, 29 and 30, if your right eye offend thee, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm very fond of, of both of my eyes. Matter of fact, I'm pretty fond of equal, equally of both of them, aren't you? Think about your eye for just a minute. Could you live without it? Now, I'm going to do something this morning to make an illustration to you. 
He says here in Matthew 5, 29, If your right eye offend thee, pluck it out and, and, and cast it far from thee. Could you live without it? Let me show you something. What if you have to live without both of them? Could you? Let me ask you, would you? If there was something sinful in your life, would you cast it out and would you live without it? I'm pretty fond of Matthew 5, 30. I'm pretty fond of my right hand. I'm right-handed. I do most things with my right hand. I, I can do a few things with, with old lefty, but I call him old lefty because he's there when I need him. I'm pretty fond of both of them, aren't you? If I had to do without one, would I? If I had to do without both, would I? I'm not talking about this morning doing without the eyes and doing without the hands in a physical sense. But if I had to cut things out of my life to go to heaven, would I do it? And that's the application of Scripture. You see, by prayer and by study of God's Word, I can make the application that I need to have that strength in my life to know that I can do all things. You see, I've got to have faith in myself to know that I can be in Christ. But not only that, I need to have a faith that is inside of others. A faith that is inside of others. And I've chosen Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 as the passage to help us with this. There are a number of passages of which could be chosen for this point, but I've chosen Hebrews 13, 5, and I want us to make an illustration from Hebrews 13, 5, the application of this passage, all the way down to several different groups inside of the body of Christ. Hebrews 13.5 is a section that says, Remember those that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Whose faith follow. That's right. Not only do I need to have faith in self, I've got to have faith in others. Whose faith follow. Now, I'm going to make the application from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, about the elders of the Lord's church. But the same application I'm making of Hebrews 13, 5 of the elders of the Lord's church is an application I'm going to make of all people in the Lord's church. We should be a people, we should live our lives in the Lord's church so that my example, so that your example could take someone to heaven. That's what life is about. Our lives should be about bringing someone else to heaven. So let's make the application to this. Following the faith of others. Well, following out the idea of elders, I want you to think about by support in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. It reads this way. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. For Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Let me tell you, those who work in the Lord's kingdom are worth and worthy of our support. I want to make the application to our elders for just a moment. Do we support our elders? And I'm telling you this morning, just as I'm talking about in faith to self, in prayer life, the way we support or oppose the eldership is going to say a lot about our faith. You'll have to answer the question whether you support them or whether you oppose them. But the same thing can be true about deacons. Deacons have a certain leadership quality about them. Now, I'm not saying they're over the elders. That's nowhere near what I'm saying. A lot of good works happen because deacons do their work. Do we support them? Let me tell you, the word support is not a word that says, thank you. That, that's not the word support. Support. To support the elders, to support those who are in the work of the Lord's church means getting in the trenches with them. It means working alongside them. It means knowing them by name. It means knowing how you can help them. It means knowing how you can support them. This morning, as you follow the faith of the elders, do you support them? You can find ways to grow by supporting them because they are worthy of their labors. Not only that, you can also support them by stance. Now, this is an interesting passage that comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And, and what I mean by stance is, is this book. I, I, know that, I, I know that the world looks at this book as an old, antiquated document. 
But remember what the Word of God is, Hebrews 4.12. Do you remember that? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not an old, antiquated document. It's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is inspired of God. And that doesn't mean it's dead. That means it is alive. It's God's Word. The only stance that we can take in the Lord's church is right here. There will never be another stance. There will never be another place. There will never be another position of which we can be by stance. Do we support them in our stance? So let's notice 2 Timothy 4, 14 through 16. It reads this way, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsake me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Will you stand when the elders take a stance on a doctrinal issue? And by doctrinal, let me just reword that, on a biblical issue. Where are you going to stand? Listen, I know that preaching on abortion is a hard stance in this country. I understand that. You know that. But do we support that? I know that when preaching about the LGBTQ community, I know that raises a lot of cane in our world. You know that too. I know that preaching about traditional marriage, it seems that we, we, we've, we've kind of moved from tre- preaching about traditional marriages to kind of having to talk about the LGBTQ community. We, we used to preach a lot about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but now it's about marriage as a whole and what marriage is. It's a simplification of it. When those issues come up, when, when sin is preached on, many times at the direction of the elders, do you support it? It's Paul here in 2 Timothy 4, 16, who said, At first, no man stood with me. There's the idea of support, and there's the idea of taking that stance. Another way to grow is by love, and this is in 2 Thessalonians. I want you to notice this 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13. It reads this way, And we beseech you, brethren, we know who we're talking about, the Lord's people, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. What are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be a people of love, aren't we? Can you grow in love? The only way you can grow in love, the only way you can grow in love, is going to go back to our other point in self, is to be a person of the Word. To be a person of the Word. You see, this has to do with more than just the elders. And we've chose Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 to, to make that illustrative point that, that that's where it started. And I chose the eldership for a very important reason. Because the Lord looks at them with such high regard that He put qualifications on that position. And He tells inside of His Word that those people, those men, are to be supported Now, the same application can go to the work of a deacon. We need to support the work of a deacon. We need to encourage them. We need to love them, all of those things. So can be the support of preaching. So can be the support of our Bible class teachers. You know, one area we really need to support more and more is our Bible class teachers. I'm not talking about the auditorium Bible class teacher. I'm talking about the teachers in the back who work every day and find a way to teach every Sunday and Wednesday. You know what's happening in those classes? Faith is being established. We need to support those things. We need to support missionaries. There's so many different ways we can make application of this. But what we need to recognize is we need to have faith in others and we need to be the type of person that someone else could look to and we could know that we could go to heaven following them. You see, this morning I'm not asking you to go on a seven-year campaign for Christ. I'm not asking you to fly to the other side of the world to do some work that will help the cause of Christ. I'm asking you this morning to have some faith in yourself and to know that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I'm asking you this morning to look around the Lord's church, to look around the Lord's body, and to find someone that you can support Find someone of which you can stand behind. Find someone of which you can love. I'm not just talking about the elders. We need to love all people in the Lord's church. Find someone else 
of whom you can love, of whom has the faith that's founded in the Word of God. I'm not asking you to go anywhere this morning. I'm asking you to stay right here in the Lord's people and find a way to put your faith in action. Find a way to be positive. Because ladies and gentlemen, I want to go to heaven. How about you? That's where I want to go. Matter of fact, the, the previous two songs before the sermon started were songs that talked about heaven. And there's another song, that's the invitation song that Jack's picked out for us that we need to sing. Because really, doesn't every invitation song talk about heaven, Jack? It's a choice. And this morning, what will your choice be? Maybe you need to become a child of God. Water is ready. Matter of fact, we've got a group of men who service that baptistry like none other. Water is ready. Are you? That's predicated on His Word. If you want to become a Christian, you can this morning. Hear His Word. Believe it. Put your faith in it. Repent of your past sins. That means turn away from them. Change. Confess the name of Christ and be immersed into water. To come into contact with the blood of Christ. To be forgiven of your sins. To be added to the Lord's church by God Himself. Acts 2.47. That's your choice this morning. You can respond if you need to. Maybe you're a child of God this morning, which I see most of you are. Maybe there's a problem in your faith. Maybe it's caused you to sin or maybe it's caused you to, to leave things undone that you need to be doing. Maybe there's doubt in your life. I, I don't know what might be in your life. You do. I know what's in my life just as much as you know what's in yours. Let's sing this invitation song as Christians and let's see if we need to respond to the Lord because that's what's important. Responding to the Lord is important. And that's the opportunity we have this morning to take our faith, to put it into action, to search our hearts, maybe even to begin our faith this morning and to be children of God as we leave this building. Let's stand and sing.